All right, we're here with Gary Shapiro, President and CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association for your oral history, welcome. Thank you very much, it's a real honor to be here. It's great to have you here, thanks. So let's start at the very beginning because I'd like for the oral histories to begin with your upbringing and your education. Talk a little bit about where you were born, your mom and dad, the early influences in your life. Well, I was born in Long Island, New York, Wontaw, near Jones Beach. Um, my mother was a Hebrew teacher who, who also sold World Book Encyclopedia from Canada. And my father uh, was a school teacher, elementary school teacher, assistant principal and principal. Um, and he grew up in New York City working in his parents' Broadway deli, a little store they owned. Uh, and their parents had come, uh, my mother's parents had escaped Russia. It took them two tries, but they finally did it. Hmm and went to Montreal, and uh, then didn't see their brothers and sisters for 50 years until they went back to Russia. And my father's parents escaped uh, Romania and Poland, where there was a history of anti-Semitics. And my um, grandmother worked in a hat factory in Manhattan, and she met my grandfather there, and they had two kids, and the rest is history. But uh, growing up on Long Island uh, was great, because my father, being a school teacher, spent a lot of time with me. Uh, we went fishing and swimming, and I had my own surfboard eventually, and I used to hitchhike to the beach. I was actually arrested for hitchhiking twice, and my father was very understanding. He never said that I shouldn't do it, never chided me, and he, said, he just said, why didn't you ask me for a ride? Because he would always give me rides. Um, and hitchhiking with a surfboard at that time, before the age of um, uh, the cars we have today, which are bigger, we, you had to find someone basically who had a van which was very difficult, usually a Volkswagen van. So I'd sometimes stand out there for an hour, hour and a half. Uh, and I started out with a, seri a series of jobs, actually. I started out very, very young because my father was a school teacher. I had three brothers. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. And uh, I started doing piecework when I was six or seven years old. My father would bring home big foam um, uh, structures from a f factory. We'd punch out curlers and we'd put them together. And, working as a family to get some money and you know that of course I was always shoveling snows <laughs> shoveling snow mowing lawns uh, working since I was a very young kid and it, it I my telling moment for me was when I was about 15 years old and my older brother was working for a temp agency and he couldn't take a phone call to come in so I pretended I was him and I said I was you know of legal age and I spent the day working in a factory. And I basically did the same thing over and over again for a full day. And when my father picked me up at the end of the day, I said, Dad, I'm going to college because <laughs> I never wanted to be stuck doing that work again. And that was a pivotal moment for me. Huh. And uh, you know, I started out as a dishwasher in a restaurant working from 5 till 2 in the morning. Um, made 20 bucks. It was great, and then moved on to other jobs, busboy, waiter. I ended up managing a number of restaurants on Long Island. Uh, the Jones Beach Theater, where Guy Lombardo performed every night, was right. the big one, um, the theater restaurant there. And that, at the age of 20, actually got me a whole bunch of experience, just managing people, solving problems, dealing with issues as they arose. That's a young age to be doing that. Yeah, I had to wear a suit, brought my brother's suit, and uh, every, I would, it, it was it was a learning experience, that's for sure. And I was, um, you know, I, I applied to a whole bunch of, I didn't know what I wanted to be, but I always wanted to keep my options open. I did well. I went to uh, Binghamton, a uh, very respected competitive private institution, a public institution in New York, uh, part of the State University of New York system. Um, and, but I just wanted to do well there because I didn't, I wanted to keep my options open. I majored in economics and psychology. But while I was there, I worked the whole time. I was a lifeguard, I was a house manager. I basically was there when different ethnic groups and other groups, the Black Student Union, the Hispanics, when they're having their parties, I'd run the sound boards and make sure that the mm -hmm. event worked well. And I, I enjoyed it tremendously. But I also raced through college. I, I graduated high school early because I wanted to go right to college. I, went, I graduated college early because I figured out that at that time you could get, take as many credits as you want and it cost the same. So I just maxed out on credits. And then when I was graduating college, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had two majors, economics and psychology, and um, ended up 
uh, working for s those summers in the um, at food service, and I was offered a full-time position um, in one of the largest food su service companies in the United States. The training was going to be in Hawaii, and I almost did it. But I realized, frankly, that I I was concerned with my own behavior, being a manager, working too late at the night, then going drinking with the employees, and that was when it was. You know, it, it wasn't frowned on in society at all to do that type of thing. But I realized it was I could, okay to do that. It was okay to even drink on the job, being the manager. Yeah. Because once everything's going, you just sit there and you, you know, open free bar essentially. And I realized that the direction I was going, I could have been an alcoholic. Huh. So I tried to rein that in about myself. And I had applied to law school, business, and graduate schools, and got on a lot of waiting lists. And two days before the semester started, I. Um, very few, including Harvard, had rejected me. I was just on a waiting list. And I ended up uh, being accepted at Georgetown. And I heard they had a beautiful campus. So I found myself two or three days later driving to Georgetown along with my father and a, a woman lawyer, a friend of ours. And I'll never forget, on the way to Washington from New York, she told me that the campus for the law school was different than the campus for the university. It was <laughs> actually in a slum at the time. It's very disconcerting. Yes. And I, was the, I think I was the youngest person in my law school class. At H Georgetown. How old were you when you started law school? I was about 20 or 21, and I graduated 22 or 23. It was 1980. Um, so, that, yeah, 23 years old. Yeah. What did you do during law school in addition to, to going to law school? Did you continue having internships and working? Well, uh, I, I, needed, working? You know, I needed money. Sure. So it wasn't. I didn't have this great career plan. Going to law school in Washington is an exceptional thing, I found out, because there's so many things to do. But right away, I needed money, and I uh, went to work for a member of Congress. I didn't care what his political stripe was. I just needed a job. And it turned out to be a great career move. And was uh, that Mickey Edwards? Yes, it was. Okay. And uh, Mickey Edwards was an expert on administrative law. He's a former FBI agent. But he was very conservative from Oklahoma, and I, uh, I was charged with responded to constituents, and I learned that outside of, there's a New York view of the world, and there's an Oklahoma view of the world, and they don't, they don't, they're not parallel. And New York is very liberal, and Oklahoma is very conservative. But I learned a lot there, and I learned about administrative law. I helped uh, write the Administrative Procedures Act, which he was an expert on, and that got me another job in a, uh, the next year in a law firm. Which and that I was loved. Squire Sanders. Well, it was a was predecessor right? to Squire. It was Nicholson and Carter and a bunch of uh, former FTC lawyers and commissioners who had gotten together. And it's a little boutique law firm. And it was very exciting uh, because by that point, I was in my second year of law school and kind of gotten understood what the law was. And they, the clients there, some of the clients were arbitrageurs on Wall Street. And the, the game was a merger would be announced. And you'd have literally minutes to figure out whether it would be approved by a court or not, or what barriers had to go through. So it required a lot of quick research. Once it got to a judge, you had to figure out what the judge had said in the past. And you know, there's a lot of all-nighters coming up with saying this will go through or it won't go through. And uh, Ivan Boski was a client, mm. and uh, we were right all the time. And I learned that speed is important, mm. um, and analysis is important. And it's being an antitrust lawyer that at the time it certainly shaped some of my thinking. Hmm. Um, did you like that area of the law immediately? Was that something you gravitated toward? I just thought it was exciting, you know, the adrenaline rush when you're proven right or not, some of the adversarial nature of it I enjoyed. Uh, I enjoyed dealing with people. Uh, I learned having worked in a member of Congress's office that the phone is your valuable instrument. Not everything is a court filing or regulatory filing. You have to deal with people as people and listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I also learned that, that brevity really is a soul of wit, and most people don't read very lengthy things. So if you can get something down to a short, compelling story and statement, or as you learn in law school, to a one-sentence issue, uh, you'll go a long way. And being part of being a good lawyer is, is not knowing everything, but it's getting rid of the, the underbrush, just coming up with the essential facts so people can make a decision. Mm. You hadn't been to Washington until you went to law school. Did, did you get the Washington bug by being there and working in Congress? Was it something that you, you found yourself saying, I love this, I really want to stay in Washington and be around this? Um, it was more gradual, I think, but I, I, Washington is full of very, very smart people, and I like that. And there are serious issues which are discussed there. I have um, a problem sometimes when you know, it, the only thing that mattered are sports or something like that. I, I, to me, it's, there are big issues affecting the future of a lot of people and even the world that are being made in Washington. And 
no matter what your political persuasion or stripe, they're really smart people. And they care, and they're passionate. And you know, the, the debate that actually occurs there is, is, I was about to say healthy, because right now at this moment in history, it's not that healthy. But generally it's healthy, because if you can get the, the issues out, the facts on the table, and at least agree what the issues are, you could solve problems. Did you, um, did you look to, to, let me back up. So when you were practicing law, did that seem like a career path you wanted to pursue for a very long time, or were you looking at other opportunities at the same time? Well, honestly, when I was younger, I always wanted to go to law school. I loved Perry Mason. I thought it would be so much fun. But the, the stumbling block is I never wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't have this great desire to be a lawyer. I just wanted to learn about the law. Yeah. And my classmates in law school made fun of me because I really enjoyed law school. It was, it was fashionable enough for everyone to hate it. And I just loved it. I just love reading the cases. I love the discussion. I just love the intellectual nature of it. I don't like what it does to you as a person. I think uh, the three-year process of law school is designed to dehumanize you in terms of an ethical sense. There's no right and wrong in law school. There's your client is right and the opposite party is wrong. And you see the world through your client's eyes and you convince yourself that you agree with them. And you know, one thing I'm still very good at is I could take either side of a question and I could debate it. Um, and it's the, so the ethical nature of a human being is sucked out of you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the reasons we have problems in, in America today is we have lawyers and we have too many of them. They're, they're uh, increasingly unemployed, but there's no law against filing lawsuits. And there's no great cost involved. So we have a phenomenal amount of litigation and there's a litigation tax. And you know, honestly, I think we have to change as a society uh, how we look at lawyers and the law. Mm -hmm. and, at that time in history, it was, you know, some of the smartest people went into law, which was a tragedy. Because lawyers generally aren't adding to the pie. They're just arguing over how it should be sliced, and they take their little vig. And it's, um, it's a tax that we put on ourselves in this country. Mm -hmm. And hopefully if someone's watching this 100 or 200 years from now, you know, they'll figure out that we should go to a loser pay system, there should be fewer lawyers, and that, you know, there shouldn't, they sh we shouldn't have a transaction tax the way we do now, because it's one of the great barriers I think our mm. society is mm. facing. Mm. Not that lawyers personally are bad people, it's, it's the process and it's, that's their profession. And the way they're rewarded. The way they're rewarded, absolutely. Yeah. So what took you to CEA? Well, I, I got a job at the Nicholson and Carl Law Firm. It merged into Squire, Sanders, and Dempsey. I was convinced to be a summer associate. And it was, it was great. Um, after law school ended, they asked me to stay on as an associate. And frankly, you know, being a summer associate, as any lawyer will tell you, is, is I, it's kind of a great job because everyone treats you well. I was also a law clerk in there while going to law school, so mm -hmm. I really knew that um, it's, you know, you're measured by the number of hours you bill. I found it difficult being an associate because, number one, it was, uh, 8081 was a recession. Uh, companies were dramatically cutting back in their law firms. So it was tough to bill hours. And number two, I didn't like having to be responsive to every partner. Um, to me, the, you know, I remember Fridays, like getting a phone call in the evening saying, you have to come in tonight. You know, there's this merger that we have to work on all weekend. I didn't feel I was in control of my, my life at all. And e even some of the practices, you know, how you build time, I was not comfortable with. You know, if you can come up with an answer in an hour or so, and um, it, it wasn't considered as good sometimes if you could come up with it in four hours or so. Not, not just squares, I'm talking about generally uh, of law firms, mm -hmm. and this is, is, mm -hmm. is it, when, you're op when you're operating and selling your time by the hour, the incentive is not to uh, do things quickly. I mean, Squire Sanders was a great law firm, brilliant lawyers there, very ethical, but the practice of law generally, I think, is, was one that I was questioning. Hmm. And hmm. so when I got the offer to go to a client, which I'd been working almost full time for anyhow, it was quite a wonderful offer for me. Um, at that time, the, I'd been, uh, the VCR was introduced, there was litigation against it. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals had held that the VCR is an illegal product because it was used for copyright infringement. And um, at that point we ran to the Supreme Court and, and they took the case and they issued an opinion. They, they heard it twice actually, they put it over for one thing, and one year and in 1984 they issued a dec decision, Sony Betamax case, 5-4, which said a VCR is legal because it has significant non-infringing uses, including recording over the air broadcast television. Along the way there, I was the lawyer in charge of the association and the industry, putting it all together. 
So I coordinated over 20 amici filings at the Supreme Court. I was, uh, with others, the public face of this issue that technology should trump copyright law, that innovation is more important than the fact that the movie studio can't control when, as they have always done throughout history, when people watch their, their product. And the movie studios, headed by uh, now deceased and who's my friend by the time the last several years of his life, uh, even a mentor, it was Jack Valenti, mm -hmm. one of the most famous association executives. But I would debate Jack Valenti. I, I was on the Today Show uh, live at the age of 26 debating uh, George David Weiss, a famous songwriter, wrote in Moon River. And I was doing debates all around the country, if not the world, about how innovation is very important. The VCR should be legal, and it's just because the copyright owners feel a loss of control doesn't mean a loss of income or opportunity. And in fact, the VCR, of course, as we all know now, even Valenti admitted they were wrong, became mm -hmm. the best friend Hollywood ever had, not Jack the Ripper, as he described it. But it wasn't only about the VCR, it was about audio recording as well. Mm -hmm. CDs had been introduced and the music industry hadn't gone to cassette tapes, so people were creating their own mixes with uh, cassette tapes. And when the music industry did go around the cassette tapes, they did high speed, it wasn't very good. And so I, we, between the debating Hollywood and debating the music industry. I wasn't making friends there in the creative community. In fact, they probably tell you even today that I was, I'm not their best friend mm. because I believe in innovation and where things can go. And, and the, you don't want to choke off new possibilities because some existing industry is out there very comfortably doing business their way. That's not what this country is about. That's not what innovation is about. Did you hang the argument on innovation from the very beginning? You know, maybe I'm doing some revisionist history. Uh, certainly, it evolved that way, so you don't want to choke off innovation. And this is a great thing that allows consumers to take control of their own lives. You don't have to go to the movie theater, pay for the expensive popcorn, and get the babysitter. This is pro-family. We tried a lot of arguments, though. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of great debates, actually. And, and, you know, the Panasonic and the Sony lawyers and others, and uh, GE was involved with 3M and mm -hmm. retailers. And we, would, we had the best minds I thought on our team, including some real stars who've gone on to, you know, Ron Brown, who became Secretary of Commerce, was tragically killed. He was there representing a bunch of Japanese companies, as was um, David Rubenstein, who started the Carlaw Group and one of the nation's lar biggest philanthropists. Uh, you know, he's funding a lot of what's going on in Washington. He's the number one philanthropist in Washington, D.C. today. Uh, but we were around it and we'd have intense debates. We'd meet every week for hours. And I'd, I'd, I'd be running the meetings at the age of 26. And I'd count to be 25 lawyers in our room. And I'd play, like, how many bill, bill you know, what's that cost per hour to have this meeting? Mm -hmm. You know, tens of thousands of dollars. But it was worth it because we were the new, young, nothing to lose people. And, and but we, we, through the process of argument, we came out with great ways of approaching it. And whether innovation was part, I frankly don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to think it was because that's all I talk about now. <laughs> <laughs> And what happened after the case was decided? Well, with the Supreme your, Court, there was, there, was, there was numerous tracks, actually. So you had the track of uh, litigation, and the Supreme Court issued an opinion, which was incredibly important. Be before the opinion came out, when the Ninth Circuit issued the decision saying the VCR should be illegal, uh, Congress immediately started the next week with legislation and hearings. And I've probably testified in over a dozen hearings over the years on whether various recording products, products that capture things, should be legal or not. Uh, and that process has got, went on for 30 years, mm. um, essentially, of various forms of legislation. Crazy proposals were, were, I mean, along the way there's some things we did right and some things we did wrong. Uh, we didn't oppose legislation which made audio recordings non-rentable. I mean, my claim to fame in part was the video, the rental of video recordings was something I believe was critical and I kind of forced it on our group. So you may, and I remember there was a lot of opposition to it, including the Panasonic lawyer tried to get me fired because she was saying that, you know, those video retailers have nothing to do with us and it's all about time shifting. I said, no, it's about renting movies as well. That's going to be big and that's to sell VCRs. Um, but there was a lot of different ways of approaching the issue. And others, for example, one of the big things that the music industry did is they came up with this rather insane system which would take a frequency notch out of music and basically require every recording device to be responsive to that missing notch. Hmm. Foolishly on their part, it was something which was in the audible spectrum. Hmm. So we had someone uh, who is a real expert listen to a lot of music 
and identify where it could really be audibly heard. And one of them, I, I think it was one of the wedding march, uh, the, the one of the wedding marches. And we just played it in the Congressional Committee. And of course, there was a revolution by music artists as well, don't corrupt my work. So the RIAA was humiliated by that, mm -hmm. the thing that they were pushing. And it was moving through Congress. We basically had proven that it corrupted music. Did so it was an exhilarating time because we were the new guys. We had the technology. And then the CD came along, other recording. The internet was starting, and, and people were arguing that the internet is the massive recording device. Uh, they argued that under the, you know, under the copyright convention, the US is a signatory to, you don't have to put a copyright notice. You don't have to do anything. If you create something original, it's copyright. It's automatic. The copyright notice has to do with the damages you're capable of getting. So they were arguing that you cannot cut and paste from someone's email. You can't do anything. Ver versus you can't send along someone's email. That's a copyright infringement. And well, technically they were right. We argued that, no, that's not a reason to shut down the internet. It's a fair use. And, and that was the Supreme Court decision as well. What fair use is? What is a fair use? So fair use is the exception in the copyright laws, which says that despite the fact that the copyright owner owns every reproduction, transmission, right, there is this safety valve. And it's a defense to copyright infringement called fair use. And it's based on four factors. The length of the work, the work. The commercial hit, what it's used for. Is it used for education? Is it used for criticism mm -hmm. or satire? Um, and fair use was broadened under the Sony Betamax case. It allowed a full recording of a full use of a movie on television. You could tape The Wizard of Oz on broadcast television for later use. And, and that was very disturbing to Hollywood and the broadcast world. But they survived. They've prospered a million fold since then, or at least 10 or 20 fold. Uh, and they've done very well even though they, they had a lot of sky is falling arguments. What happened to the arc of your career after the Sony decision? Well, the, the Sony, I was very visible. So I was doing sure. a, a lot of um, television, radio, news, uh, debates all around, arguments going around the country. I, I, had, I organized all the video retailers into a, an association, it became a national association, and they were our, became our best allies because you needed consumers, real people, to contact their members of Congress to let them know these are as important. But our strategy, our long-term strategy, is we just, have to, we just have to keep the status quo of the products are legal. Because once members of Congress at their salary range, the product, we knew the prices would come down. Once they understood that these were not recording devices where you just put in a movie and make another movie, once they understood them and appreciated them, then we knew we were safe. Just as with, uh, you know, new technologies came along when TiVo was first introduced. Mm -hmm. They had a competitor called Replay. Replay was sued out of existence by the, music, the movie and broadcasting industry. But TiVo survived in part because some of the broadcasters had made an investment, so they weren't the first to be sued. But in part because on the stage at the international CES, the chairman of the FCC, when I asked him what product he liked, he responded immediately and he said, this is Michael Powell, he said, TiVo, it's God's product. And we were walking off stage and he said, I'm in big trouble for saying <laughs> that, but I believe it. And the headline, certainly, sure, the Associated Press headline, I believe, was, that quote, right. the, and, and they, they knew as an industry, you can't try to make something illegal that people love. Right. And now, even though you know, there might be an arguable case against it, it's not being brought, nor right. should it be brought, because you know, what's happened with technology is the technologies which are introduced, you say, why do I need that? Like the garage door opener, um, which uses um, unlicensed spectrum, like the cordless telephone. You know, once we got away from the cord, you were going to these became, or the microwave oven, these became necessities. So when you go into a hotel room today, if you don't have a flat screen, a remote control for your TV sets, another example, you, you judge where you are by the technology that's there. A dock for your iPod. Absolutely. So, so these things have become just accepted and important, and you can't take them away from people once they have them. It's like, you know, there's passion on the gun owner debate on both sides, whether you should own guns. Well, gun owners are passionate. That's why they're successful. Right. Um, and once you are used to having something, you should have it. So our products are pretty safe right now, except when we lose. I said, what else? Well, there's some legislation, a law, which basically puts a royalty t tax on audio recording equipment today. Mm. There's no real audio recording equipment because no one wants to pay that tax, so it's shifted over into the computer, and that's where the recording went. And that, artificially changed the marketplace. We should never have agreed to that. We never should have agreed also to the, uh, the lengthening of the copyright term. It's, Congress extended it 
uh, over a 40-year period about a dozen times, and now it's almost perpetual, and it's been held that that's okay by the Supreme Court, because the U.S. Constitution says limited terms, and the Supreme Court's interpreted that to mean as long as one year less than forever, pretty much. So that has given the copyright owners, they have gotten tremendous authority, over, and, and there's very little in the public do domain now, because they use their lobbying forces to keep extending the copyright term. So instead of copyright being something to reward copyright owners for a short period of time, then the public benefits, now it's viewed as by the court, and by Congress, sadly, because the copyright industry is a phenomenal giver to Congress in so many different ways, it's virtually forever. Have you seen and patents that as haven't a, gone that way. Have you seen that as a CEA issue? This I would now. Copyright? Yeah. I didn't then. Yeah. I think because to introduce new products, you need content. Content owners are reluctant, usually, not all these. The motion picture industry switched around. They work with us, and I worked on the DVD standard. Uh, we had a multi-industry effort. I remember negotiating with Jacqueline on that, and I agreed to a couple things I regret there. One of them, there was regional encoding. I thought that would be uh, broken down for antitrust reasons, so you can't use your devices in Europe and Asia and the U.S. They're encoded differently. They're, mm -hmm. they're built differently. There's different systems. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a shame because a lot of people travel back and forth. Sure. And the other one is that we also, they wanted their piracy notice in there. So uh, we agreed that the, the DVD players and generations would be built so you can't skip past the copyright notice. But what they've cleverly done, which I find annoying, is that they've inserted a lot of previews. So sometimes now you have to get through the previews before you get to the copyright notice and your device will not let you skip through. Which is, uh, which is, it is what it is. It was probably a mistake on our part. But generally standardizing and having some copy protection in there, uh, we did it voluntarily industry to industry and it's worked out pretty good. However, it's not all been perfect, but I think the historical results show that you know, content has flourished, the internet, movies, music, it's not, the established companies have had mixed results, but new entrants have come into the market because of innovation and technology, and people are consuming more content than they ever have before. So let's get back to your career uh, now. After your, your, your at CEA, Sony decision has been issued. It's a big win. Um, how, how, did you, how did you see yourself at CEA at that point, and, and what happened in the subsequent few years? Well, I went into the, we started out as a radio manufacturers association, became the TV and radio, and then brought it out to the electronic industries association through a series of corporate transformations. We ended up as the consumer electronics association. Well, when I joined in the early 80s, there was really three products, the radio, the television, and the turntable. The CD was being introduced. The VCR was just starting. All of a sudden, there was an explosion in products in different categories. A CB radio had been big and mm -hmm. kind of went out, but radar detectors were coming in. Um, watches were all of a sudden being a, a mass-produced consumer item based on electronics. Calculators were huge. You know, I bought my first calculator as a Father's Day gift with my brothers, and we chipped in. We, I think we spent $400, which at the time was amazing. We probably have it downstairs. Yeah, probably. Yeah. You, know, you know, then you open up a bank account. You got I mean, calculators right. are giveaways now. Uh, so many new products were being created, and I remember you, you, we would, you know, it's part of my job was to follow legislation in states, and we'd go in on Saturday with a 300 baud mo modem, and we'd wait several hours to download what states were doing. I mean, it was the slowest process in the world. Um, but with progress, you know, now it's a... Sure. Clear, but basically the interface where we were was the interface with the consumer and industries, the phone industry, the cable industry, the motion picture industry, the music industry, and our job was to make sure that the policy world was not obstructing these things. And it, it took out a whole bunch of devices. For example, car navigational devices, which were navigationally challenged people like myself, they're, they're essential. It's most, one of the most important products in my view, because I get lost a lot, mm -hmm. even with the devices. Um, I, had to, I went around to several states and I had to get them to change their laws so you could watch TV mm -hmm. as a driver because it banned any video display. Well, that video display was providing important information. Where you're going, um, that was important. Mm -hmm. Also, there were safety issues associated with our products which became important. Uh, this was the early 1980s. The Sony Walkman had just been introduced. People were wearing these things and some people were getting killed on train tracks because they didn't hear the train coming. Uh, they, were just, they were driving with them on. So part of it was a public education campaign. I remember the New York State Attorney General uh, was 
I think threatening or actually suing a number of our companies. And I negotiated a deal with the Attorney General where every company would insert with their headset, you know, this little pamphlet we've, we agreed and fought over the language on. You know, use your head when you use your headset. Well, some companies are still using that language 30 years later. Uh. Uh, because in a way that's an insurance policy against lawsuits. Was there a debate within the association at that point about what was a, a device or a company that should be part of CEA's Absolutely. So when community? I joined, we had about 40 companies, you know, Zenith and uh, RCA and 3M and Sony US and Panasonic US. It was US companies. Big only. companies. Big companies, and when in the end of the 80s, when I'd gone from being a lawyer to my my predecessor, uh, moved on to a different job, uh, I was hired in 1991, or I was shifted 1991 to take over the whole consumer electronics portion of what was then a large organization. Um, I negotiated a little bit for the deal. I said we can't just be an old boys club. We have to, if we want to be effective in Washington, what we have to do is we have to include smaller companies, startups, and go and be as broad as possible to find consumer electronics broadly and even look at going after the distribution channel, meaning retailers. Had that been an issue in Congress for you up to that point? Were you hearing from people as you were doing your policy work, you guys are just a big company? Not only a big company, you know, Jack Lenny and, and the music industry people would just say, oh, it's a bunch of foreign-owned companies, uh -huh. which wasn't true. I mean, there were definitely some, but they had U.S. facilities and Americans worked for them, but there was also a lot of U.S. companies uh, doing different things. So, uh, you know, we, we were able to handle that debate, but, you, you know, most members of Congress do not live in big populated urban areas and are, are, are tech savvy, so they need to hear from people in their constituents. So we needed as many constituents. If we got in Radio Shack, we'd have 4,000 stores across the United States, reachable with a push of the button in the computer. I was, I'd visited Radio Shack. I'd been in the CEO's office and he demonstrated the system. I wanted that. And I also wanted to define consumer electronics very broadly. And uh, they agreed and they, you know, as boards evolved, it took a lot of internal debate and we're still not quite there yet. Mm. Uh, but we've expanded now to where over 2,000 companies. Was there an aha moment for you at the early point of your career where you saw what CEA could be beyond what it was at that, at that time? It was a, the rush of excitement that there's potential in technology, which I don't know what it is, but certainly um, the going to digital uh, with CD, it was, it was obvious to me that CD was better, although there's still a debate in some segments whether digital music is better than analog music and for a lot of reasons. But in video, we knew it was going to happen. And I got very excited about the possibility of advanced television or high definition television. I spent a lot of my career making sure the U.S. had a standard and impediments were removed. And that was a battle with the broadcasters, frankly, but we worked with them. You know, in Washington, what I've learned is co-opetition is very important. And even how we run our trade show is you, go, you reach out to your competitors and your adversaries, and you establish relationships so it's not personal, and you also, um, you learn about them, and you partner with them when you can. So I was always willing to partner. For example, we would always invite, as a matter of policy, see even today, we invite our adversaries to speak at our meetings and, and give them a public stage so the, so the public, the journalists, and members of Congress can hear the debate and understand, because we're so convinced that we're right. They're convinced they're right. The difference is they're representing a small constituency. We're representing the future. We're representing innovation. We're representing the possibility that you don't know about. And that is so important. And, and I believe, and my mother, the World Book Encyclopedia salesman, and for those listening to this who don't know what that is, there was a time in history when everything was dead trees and paper, and all of knowledge was in this encyclopedias. And you would buy them for your home if you were, wanted to step up your kid's education. And my mother was passionate mm. about the value of education, the value of encyclopedias. And she also told me you can't sell something unless you're passionate about it. I'm passionate about innovation. I'm passionate about the future. I'm passionate that innovation will change the definition of what problems are, whether it's in healthcare, in agriculture, in so many areas. We have the tools. Right now we're in an exciting time because we're just putting them together to solve major problems. The cost of healthcare, for example, is going to come down dramatically as we get more sophisticated in diagnosis and costs in telemedicine, there's so many things that are happening that are right right now. So my, my view is I don't, it's not the Consumer Electronics Association that is my passion and excitement. It's the potential and the future that's there that must be allowed to solve the world's problems mm -hmm. and may not be held down by any particular industry because they have a lot of lobbyists in Washington, a lot of political influence. 
And that's, that's what I believe in. That's why we created something called the Innovation Movement. That's, that's the guiding theme around our membership. The corporate members care about things that affect their companies. Of course they do. And, and we work on when there's a joint thing, that's what we work on. But really, it's what we're focused on is the future of innovation. And we feel it's, it's the essential gift to the next generation. Um, let's go back to HDTV for a minute. Uh, it's turned out to be a tremendous boon for broadcasters. Why w did they oppose it so strongly in the beginning? Well, from their point of view, they were being forced to make an investment in new technology, buy all sorts of new equipment, and get, not be able to charge any more for advertising, which was their source of revenue. Um, which is why they'll probably be the last ones to go over to ultra high definition 4K and then 8K. Because why should they make the investment? Because it's capital expense, is, is money that's taken no matter how you finance it from your bottom line. Um, so they were, they were not in a rush. And they didn't see any competitive advantage. Now, it wasn't only broadcast. Well, I, I remember a discussion with Bob Costas uh, talking about when are you going to go to, you know, could we do the, uh, the Olympics, I think it was of uh, 96 Olympics in HDTV, and how the importance of HDTV for sports, because to me it was all sports and movies, it would, that's all that mattered. Um, and he just, not only did he look at me like I was crazy and, and respond that way, but when we asked NBC formally to do it, we got a nasty letter from the lawyers saying we shouldn't even use their name. I mean, so mm -hmm. we, we had a lot of trouble um, convincing broadcasters to go forward. Although, well, we did eventually agree to help fund the model station and do the Advanced Television Test Center, and then we created something called the model station. And the cable industry was always very easy to work with uh, on some of these issues, because they always viewed, they were very strategic, they focused their future on how do we get pipelines into home and maximize the value, whether it's entertainment or broadband connectivity. And, and their strategy, they said 15 years ago, is, is working. I mean, they're making a lot of money just from selling broadband mm -hmm. connectivity to the home for internet access. Uh, broadcasters, though, they have a cash cow and, and, and they have a lot of spectrum. They're also worried about giving up their spectrum. The challenge we face at this point in history is that there's not enough spectrum um, for, for what we need for wireless. And it's, uh, I give the Obama administration and the FCC a lot of credit for focusing on it. And Congress. Well, I worked very hard along with a lot of others to make sure Congress uh, work has allowed some various processes to go forward where hopefully we'll get some more spectrum from the government and from broadcasters. How did the arrival of the PC affect the association? Oh, it was, uh, there were, I remember one of the first things I lobbied on in Congress was to get, uh, I think it was September, designated Computer Learning Month. And I did that in the early 1980s, working with IBM and uh, a couple others. And I was really proud of that achievement, because to get a bill through Congress affirmatively, even if it was, frankly, as meaningless as that, because it, it didn't change it, you know, Congress just declares a month. But it was, it was satisfying to go to office to office and get people to sign on. So that was early on. That was the early days of the PC. And then in like 1991, I remember appearing in an IBM uh, video news release talking about, you know, a chicken in every pot, a computer in every home. Because I was advocating that. You know, the, the future is that everyone must have a computer. Uh, I certainly did not envision uh, how it would transform into essentially your smartphone or your tablet. Although we did call the tablet market several years ago, and we said there's a lot of room, our association was pointing this out, there's a lot of room for an intermediate device in the, between the small screen of the uh, telephone and a large screen of the television set. Was there another association that was trying to represent or make policy for personal computers or for companies who are primarily involved in computing as opposed to other types of electronics? I mean, there's a, a number of associations which, and there's increasingly more, which use IT or internet in their name. So we have, and their colleagues and friends, and we work together on 99% of the issues. So there has always been a lot of associations. My view of that is that's great. Sometimes the more signatures on a letter or an ad or any advocacy piece, the, the bigger the group looks. So, but, but there's a free market, essentially, uh -huh. for associations. In some countries, you must belong to an association, and there are the government-sanctioned ones. In our country, you could belong to anything you want, and you don't have to belong to anything. So uh, we pretty much own the consumer electronics portion, and we have all the IT companies that are, uh, have anything interface with the consumer at all. So our prospect list at this point is pretty low in terms of gaining new members. You describe in your, um, in your book, Ninja Innovation, you talk about the strategy pivot that really changed the face of the consumer electronics show. 
Can you talk a bit, now that CES and international CES is such a juggernaut, the, the definitive show of its kind anywhere in the world, how did you envision that and, and move the association to get it to that point? So when I took over the uh, role in 1991, it was a recession. Uh, Comdex was the show. It had grown from almost nothing in the early 80s to the largest show in the country, if not the world. And that was really a computer-driven show. Totally computer-driven. And I was uh, a new executive, and I, I, I remember saying one of the board members, the head of Cassio, John McDonald, I said, it seems unfair that I'm heading this organization at a very difficult time. Um, and he said, Gary, you don't understand, an idiot can run anything in good times. It's in bad times when you really have to need smart people with moxie. And he's right, actually. I mean, a lot of people in positions are lucky, including me, frankly. So I've rode this wave for over 20, 30 years, essentially, of growth in technology and innovation. Um, but it's when the rubber hits the road that you really have to work your hardest. And that's why the other a lot of people don't like the boom and bust cycle of economic recessions and things like that. They do really perform a cleansing operation and force people to innovate, which I think has value. It's painful on an individual basis. People lose, anytime someone loses their job, it's a painful experience. It's, uh, it, uh, and, and that's one of, I view as my job. I approve every termination of our 150 employees because that's someone's life you're dealing with. And it's, so it's difficult. And it's, as I always tell my staff, it's better to be part of a growing organization than a shrinking one. So you want growth. Um, Comdex was coming on so strong that they were starting to go after our customers. Comdex was defining themselves as the largest, not only IT show, but consumer electronics event. So they were, they were trying to do the same pivot that you... Oh, they did. Yeah, so they, I remember of. Panasonic uh, took out a bigger presence in Comdex than they did with us, and I, I asked them why. They said, oh, they get more people than you. And I said, wow, well, they're a public show. They're open to anyone who wants to go. And we're a trade show. We're, you have to be qualified to go to our show. It didn't matter. It was numbers. A lot of the Asian companies are numbers driven like that. What was the size of, C of CES at that point, average attendance? Oh, it was uh, under 100,000, maybe 80, 90. Mm -hmm. but, the, the other, but we took a, our strategy was, first of all, we want to be honest in our numbers. So we're going to start some, we're going to get independent auditors to come in and say how many people were actually there and what categories and verify and issue a statement. And you know, whatever they say, we will follow. And we challenged Comdex to do the same. Comdex didn't do it. And when IBM pulled out of Comdex, that's what they gave according to the Wall Street Journal. The reason they told the journal was they refused to audit their numbers. Because I, I, we had a partnership with Comdex to do, a, we did a second event, a spring event, because both of us were dying at the time. And it was a clash of cultures. They were very focused on maximizing the dollar from each event rather than planning for the long term. And I remember sitting in the car driving with them. They were debating what number they would use for the number of people. They said, ah, let's do 225. No, we don't want to, they'll sound too big. People won't come. So, I mean, honestly, a lot, and a lot of show organizers do this. It's very difficult to actually come up with precise numbers for attendance. Uh, technology has made it a little easier, but it's still, you don't know. And we also know a lot of people go to Las Vegas, but never go to the show. They're going visiting suites. They're doing things that are connected with the event. Anyway, the bottom line of it is our strategy was be honest, treat your exhibitors well, invest for the future heavily, and go after, they're going after them, after us, we're going after them. And the pivotal thing was we invited Bill Gates to speak, we invited uh, Scott McNeely, Larry Ellison, we got them all as speakers, and we made the biggest deal about it. Now the truth is, when you go to events like us, and even Comdex, the people who listen to those speakers uh, is under 10%. But they define what the show is about. So if we ever want to go into a future of the show, we go after the leading company, the leading speaker, and we get them there. You know, and Bill Gates was interested in going to Consumer Electronics, it was a great marriage, and he always drew a crowd from around the world. So we started being aggressive. We went into their turf and we got the computer companies in um, and, and we just defined ourselves. And, and they were, frankly, they started focusing on the short term only, the bottom line, selling whoever bought it would try to resell it. And they sold for 880 million or so. To, uh, and then it kept being sold for lower and lower amounts until it was a dollar for the name someone bought.
And now so we beat them, essentially. They yeah. went out of business, essentially. And you opened it to the public, too. You opened CES we to the public, a, which We opened our dying show in Chicago to the public. So wow. we had two shows each year. And this, this, the Chicago show was going away for a variety of reasons. One, it was a bad, badly timed. Two, there was nothing really new in product introductions for a while, and it didn't fit the timing cycle. Chicago was considered a very difficult place to do business because of the union issues there. Uh, and it just was going down. The Las Vegas show was going up, so eventually we transformed, to make a long story short, there was one mega show, and that's the international CES in January, and we keep redefining what consumer electronics is. So we went after Hollywood, we went after Wall Street. We decided that you could fit in a, a small room the number of retailers that mattered, so we had to go after other categories, we had to redefine. We have the auto industry now, we have uh, growing as healthcare, there's all sorts of new categories we see, whether it's robotics, nanotechnology, uh, all sorts of new things happening very quickly. What's the most, over, over the course of this period, what's the most surprising trend you have seen? What's the, the, is there something that just came out of nowhere and became huge and you thought, wow, that's, that's really incredible? Uh, honestly, nothing comes to mind that I was surprised about in a positive way because I am, if anything, more enthusiastic <laughs> than I should be over some of the introductions. On the other hand, I, when categories of, or products have flopped, I have not been that surprised either. I've been wrong a couple of times. My perhaps most embarrassing mistake was Microsoft uh, had a product introduction at our show and um, I was at the rehearsal. I was the only non-Microsoft person in the room and because I do a lot of these things, I had some very specific suggestions about how they were presenting it, what they say, their pace. And I talked to one of the Microsoft people and they looked at me very nervously and said, you should just tell that directly to Bill. So I went and I talked to Bill Gates and, I, and he actually listened and eventually incorporated most of what I had suggested. Um, but what I did foolishly say, and I think this introduction is to be one of the most significant introductions in history. Well, it was Microsoft's, it was the dancing paperclip which was mandatory on, and you couldn't remove it from your screen and it became one of the most annoying things, it was called Bob. And actually, ironically, it was, um, it was the brainchild or at least the adopted child of, of then, I think it was Bill's fiance at the time, maybe his wife. And so no one would tell Bill that it wasn't a good idea and I foolishly said, this is a great idea. Uh, and I'm embarrassed, I don't know why that, my biggest mistake is what I choose to share, but um, the lesson for me there was, number one, I'm, you know, I'm, I may not be the best at picking the products uh, after just watching one rehearsal in a, in a, for a product introduction. And number two, the bigger lesson was, as a CEO of a company, Bill Gates should not have been, at, given his relationship with that woman who was, it was her project, no one wanted to criticize it. And mm. you know, what makes a great company versus a good company is the diversity of thought, the ability to actually confront the leader if you think the leader is wrong. Um, and I don't think that occurred in that case. I think mm. that everyone was scared about pillow talk. And that's not how you should hire people or relate in a company. And I've been very sensitive about that in my own company. And I see companies, you know, I see family owned businesses, I see how you make decisions, and you have to be very careful that you're getting, and I even see like, to me, a lot of the Asian companies don't have that diversity of thought. They just, they just are dealing with consensus and following the party line, and that doesn't lead to good decision making. Let's talk a little bit about what it's like to work with Congress, what it's been like and what it's like today. So first of all, talk just a, a bit about your philosophy of how you lead an organization like this to work with Congress to get things done. I think um, in dealing with Congress, you have to recognize, first of all, they're all human beings. And one of the lessons my brother taught me in life is that humans share a common bond. You know, they care, number one, about their family. They're excited about it, they're passionate about it. And if you can relate to them as human beings, essentially, your relationships start and the results follow. So in dealing whether it's Congress or dealing with potential customers or anyone, you, you have to establish a human link. Uh, you just can't have a great case and hand someone a piece of paper and expect them to agree with you. So relationships are important, which is why there's so many lobbies in one. It's not just about the money and the financial contributions. There are people there who have relationships so that the ears will be open because they trust that person. Um, so that's number one. Number two, you have to be, have some principles. So one of the principles our organization has, which I'm pretty proud of, 
is we've never asked Congress for money. We believe in the power of innovation, and that's what must be protected. We're not one of the you know, 10,000 industries in Washington with our groups who are saying, give us a piece. We don't even support the R&D tax credit, even though a lot of our sister associations do, a lot of our com company members do. As a position, we don't oppose it, but we don't advocate for it. So we've never advocated for everything. Even during the high definition television transformation, I had a member of Congress who was so angry at me because they're trying to give our industry essentially billions of dollars in the form of coupons that they could turn it in retail to buy converter boxes for the transition. And I refused to support it on behalf of our organization, our industry. And he couldn't understand that. And I said, we have a principle that we don't ask the government for money. And, and sometimes I'd have to deal with our industry members one-on-one -on -one, uh, to, to make sure they understand that in the long term you have to be principled. Um, third thing is you have to have a history of being right. So, I think part of arguing any case is acknowledging and confronting the weaknesses in your argument, rather than having the member of Congress learn about it from the other side. Then the member of Congress feels you haven't been truthful. So whether it's a debate with anyone or um, talking to the member of Congress, I point out what the other side is saying and say why we disagree with it. You have to have your facts, uh, you have to have a history of credibility, and you have to be right. So the challenge I face, the toughest challenge is I don't want to say the sky is falling, because I think you lose credibility that way. But sometimes I don't know if the sky is falling, because I don't know what area of innovation will be choked off. So that's why when Congress is about to act like they, the, the real groundbreaking historic action by our world was a couple of years ago with a SOPA PIPA debate where the content world, the music industry, the motion picture industry were pushing through Congress legislation which would allow anyone to shut down a new company on the internet by claiming a copyright infringement. They could shut down a website just with a claim. And we said, this is crazy. Let's work together. Let's change it. We understand that this pirated pe product that shouldn't be sold. Let's talk about a solution. And they said, we don't need you. And they wouldn't talk to us. They got it through the Senate Judiciary Committee unanimously. It was very embarrassing. We were the only ones out there fighting early. And fortunately for us, we got uh, Darrell Liza, who was the former, he's a member of Congress, former chairman of our board. Um, he stood up on it. So the first time he stood up for us on an issue, he'd been in Congress for 10 years. And he stood up and took a position, as did a Democrat in the Senate. Um, uh, uh, I'm losing his name, um, from Oregon, who's now, Ron Wyden, Senator Ron Wyden. Uh, and they held a press conference at CES, and we got on board uh, Wikipedia and all the internet companies, and they sh a lot of them shut down their sites for a, a day. I remember that, that was incredibly effective. Five million um, constituents contacted their members of Congress that week, and within 24 hours, members of Congress had pulled their name off the legislation and it died. It was the most effective time shrunk event in American history in terms of contact in Congress. And, the le and they're scared now of the tech industry in part because of that. It hasn't stopped them because there's you know, literally hundreds of lobbyists trying to preserve their position for the, either the motion picture industry, the music industry, or whatever. So we're still fighting battles every day. And you know, if they don't win with Congress, they do things to the administration. They'll put it into a treaty. They'll do it behind closed doors. They'll do it, I mean, they do, there's, I feel like we're playing whack a mole all the time, trying to get down what's popped up. And I feel we've been right. I feel we've been right because the technology industry has changed the world. Because in the US, we have a very unique approach. Yes, we're up against the biggest lobbies anywhere in the world, and they are difficult to beat. But all we have, we don't have to beat them, we just have to slow them down so they can't get what they want because it's tough to get something through Congress. But what we have here is unique. We have Silicon Valley and other areas of the country. We have an immigrant culture, which is the most diverse country in the world, which is a lot of different points of view. Despite what people lament about our educational system, some of which is true and of concern, we have kids we train to ask the question why or why not. They don't just, they're not great at memorizing by rote, but they're learning. We have the First Amendment, which protects us, so if someone with a new idea comes, they can express it, and government just can't shut them down without some process, whether by Congress or a court. Even though they're competition, the old status quo guys are trying to kill them, whether it's an Uber with a new taxi service, which we support and are a member of ours, or um, an area, which is the current litigation right now, we go out and we gather in the little guys that are new because we believe in the little guy having a chance, uh, even if it hurts someone's business model. As long as it's ethical, honest, and there's a good case for it, they should be allowed to change things because we're a nation that changes. So we have a lot of the ingredients, and here we still have winners and losers, and, we, and losing isn't a bad thing because you learn something. The, the only culture in the world except for Israel where failing is okay. 
and it's a good thing. So you take our great university system, our culture of being a, basically we all de descend from immigrants, other than Native American Indians uh, and, in, and, and slaves, people who came here for a better life. And it's our culture that we come from people that want a better life. We ask, why not? Why can't I do better? Come up with a way of doing things better. And that's what's encouraged. And I think that's our asset as a nation. And that's what we fight for. That's why we have the innovation movement. That's why we're fighting everything so that future generation of Americans and even the world will benefit from what we have here. We're not going to compete on the basis of having the lowest cost factories in the world. Mm -hmm. We just can't. We're too highly educated and we're too restless. So that is what we've been fighting for for the last several years. And it's what we believe in. And that's what when I, me and, and the people who work at CEA, come to work every morning is for the cause of innovation because yeah, we believe in it. You, you remarked earlier about the difficulty in Congress now, not, not the difficulty CEA working with Congress, just the atmosphere of trying to get things done in Washington. What, why has that happened and how will that change? This, it's multifactorial. There's a lot of reasons. I mean, what, when I was growing up, we were unified by what we hated. We hated the Soviet Union and we feared them. And that drove us into space, it drew our technology, it drew us to build better computers. We had to beat the Soviets, they were threatening our lives. Um, and we hated them, and that unified the country. Our country was unified when Kennedy was killed, during the Challenger disaster, during September 11th. We came together as a country and we believed things and we got things done in Washington after each of those times because we felt something together. Sadly, what we have now is we have turned on ourselves. The Republicans and the Democrats, the conservatives and the liberals really hate each other. You know, the internet is phenomenal and it's great, but the, the challenge is there's a lot of unfiltered content and you realize the depth of the mm -hmm. hatred when you read the liberals and the Huffington Post on the one hand and how they all seem to agree and they hate conservatives. And then you read what the conservatives write on American Spectator or other conservative blogs and they both hate, they're haters. And I think, you know, we're at a period in time where our parties are living off this hate and, and encouraging it. And, and we, we lack leadership of togetherness. We're all in this together. I mean, take something as basic as healthcare. You know, I feel lousy now. I have a bad cold, I think. And, and I hope in the future, whoever's watching this 100 years now, you've solved that problem. But no one in America should suffer from a health care problem. We could have gotten Republicans and Democrats to agree that Americans have a right to health care to the extent that's out there. And once you define that and saying, how do we do that together and define the issue, which is the issue, how do you make sure Americans get health care? And then you can say, well, what are the facts? How do we get there? We could have had a discussion and a debate. We didn't have it. We had one party force something on that, that you know, close to half Americans didn't. And it's, it's drowned us for four years now and probably drown us in the future for a long time because we're, we're forcing things on each other rather than having a discussion where we solve problems. So other people talk about the influence of money and, 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 and it's all true, and lobbyists, and there's all, it's all true. But we have divided ourselves into two opposing camps. I'm proud that I've become affiliated with a group called No Labels, which has gathered almost 100 members of Congress, and they say it's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's let's solve problems together. Let's talk about it as Americans. Mm -hmm. Put your you know, put your fellow citizens over your party. Having parties to me is kind of absurd anyhow. Will the change that's needed to try to get more of a problem-solving attitude in Congress come through that kind of movement? It will come through this movement or something connected in the future. Like, the movements are sometimes intense. To me, the movement really should be about the fact that the next generation and generations behind are totally getting killed by this generation. Our generation has promised ourselves something we can't possibly deliver whether it's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, we have a, a number. Numbers don't lie. It's the only absolute science in the world of, of math and physics where there are immutable things that occur. So you can't build up this phenomenal debt, these phenomenal promises, and not raise taxes dramatically, or even if you do, you can't, we can't do it all. So we have to make tough decisions. It's a mathematical certainty. And I'm talking at a point where there's 0% interest rates. Interest rates go up to a normalized 5%. 5% on a $20, $25 $20 trillion debt, you're talking about spending literally trillions of dollars to just service the debt. That leaves nothing for defense or education or healthcare. Right? So we are in trouble. And my only frustration today is where is the generation 
that is getting hurt by this? Why are we, the greedy geezers, taking away their future? So that all they're going to have is debt. So I believe at some point they'll figure it out. Uh, I think the challenge is, is they're very focused on their present job or getting through school. But you know, the movement that I grew up with was the anti-Vietnam War movement, which mm -hmm. is really a movement of youth that believed passionately that that war was wrong and unwinnable. And whether or not they were right or wrong, I remember you know, arguing and wearing a black arm at the school and getting beat up for it. I remember my father saying the, why the, the domino theory of the Vietnam War was right, but eventually he was convinced. And I think history has shown that the youth were right then. But since then, there's been no youth movement that I'm aware of in any significant way. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's, anti, there's you know, generational theft which is occurring today. And Republicans and Democrats, I mean, Republicans maybe less so because they are focused on the deficit. There's just a refusal to address the toughest problems. So even when you, if you talk about something as minor as cutting postal service on a Saturday or adjusting the cost of living for Social Security, you have literally millions of people saying, my right to this has been taken away from me. And I, it's a failure of political leadership. It's a failure of leadership in our country. And you know, I, I, it kills me to, and, and one of the reasons I'm passionate about it is because to get personal, I had, I got married again fairly late in life when I was over 50. No, I was approaching 50 rather. And my wife, although younger than me, we thought was past childbearing age. And after a few years of marriage, she got pregnant. And all of a sudden, I was confronted with the fact that as we decided to go forward and have the baby, which was a very difficult decision, um, that we're bringing somebody into the world who will be there for a long time when we won't be. We won't be there around for most of his life because you know, I'm 57 now. And it's sad, but I'm not going to be there for And by the way, so I have a five and a half year old now. Uh, and so all of a sudden, it became a very personal issue for me that this, this, this kid, I'm not going to be around. And he's inheriting something which I helped create. So it became very personal. I, you know, as long as I have a platform, I have a board that thankfully is passionate as I am about this. They believe the most important thing for the future health of our industry is the future health of the American economy. And they felt, and we all agreed, that the American economy is in trouble because our government leaders are not making good decisions about how they're spending and they're not confronting the reality of a certain future of numbers. Um, so we believe together that you have three choices. You could raise taxes, you could cut spending, or you could grow. And growth comes from innovation. So we've advocated for higher taxes. We're the only organization probably in Washington that does. Lower spending. We supported the Bipartisan Deficit Commission findings. I think we're the only association that has. But where we have more control and we have a lot more input is growth. Growth coming from innovation. So we fight for innovation because innovation is where the jobs, where the culture is going, and everything else. So I have this now almost six-year-old son and every day I look at him and see him, it's like, what kind of future will you have when I'm gone? And I owe him something. You know, shockingly enough, though, a few years later, my wife got pregnant again. And uh, now I have a one and a half year old. And it's even more important <laughs> because, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, my wife's a, 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 a retina surgeon. And we've kind of figured out how babies are made at this point. But um, having young children is, yeah. at a later stage in life, is a very different experience. I've, I've, two kids in their late 20s now. Mm. You know, they're pretty much on their own. They, they're, they're set. They know what they're going to do. And when I was then, when I was raised, I didn't think about it at all. I didn't think about the far future or the, the lives. Of, I was just like raising the kids and always tired and trying to, you know, focus on my job. But now my job and my personal um, promise, in a sense, to my children, my younger children, is, have collided in a happy way. That's great. Let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, I have a question here that you may need to reflect on for a minute, but uh, you've, you've observed so much about consumer attitudes uh, over the time that you've been with the association and, and seeing the things that catch on within international CES or, or don't. Um, can you sum up what you've learned about the attitudes of, of consumers, especially American consumers, based on what you've seen. And is that different in other parts of the world? Well, Americans always want the best. So during the high definition television debate, for example, um, there was a few different ways we could have gone. Japan started out with the first 
high definition system. It was analog. And they had to recall over 100,000 TV sets as they saw this breakthrough that occurred in the United States going to digital. Europe was convinced there was a two-step system. In fact, the first time I went overseas in my life was a business trip to France to speak at a conference about high definition television. And I said, as polite as I could, that they were wrong, that they have to go for the best system possible because their consumers will demand it. Um, and that is indeed what happened. They, they started with a system in Europe that was subpar, and consumers essentially went to the satellite companies and bought the big HDTV sets because they wanted them. And satellite started killing broadcasting, and they quickly abandoned what they were doing and went to a full high definition television. In the US, there was a battle that went on between those who wanted a cheaper way of doing things, and Fox Broadcasting was one of the leaders. They thought 480 Progressive was good enough. I remember that. And, um, and there were those that are, and a, a large group of us who were passionate. We had to give the best possible system to the Americans. That's why we created the Advanced Television Test Center. And you know, I was the only non-broadcaster in the room there at these meetings. And we were, to me, it was like, there were some people who were focused on the process. Like, there was 23 systems that were tested there. And if like a component broke, they said it was too bad, so sad, you go home, you've lost, you know, your results stink. And I was like, no, we're creating a new system of television, the future. We can't, a component breaking down in a test is not disqualifying. You have to give them a chance. You have to be, we want the best system. And eventually, I mean, we, we did come up with the best system. It was unique in the world. And, and it's worked for the American topography and geography, which is very widespread, as opposed to Japan, which is very concentrated. You can reach everyone with one satellite. Um, so we did what was best. The Japanese went to mobile products. I said Europe a lot quicker and faster. Mobile meaning mobile video, which never took off. Well, it hasn't at this point in time. Mobile television has not taken off. Um, so Americans are different. We demand the best, and we want choice. Japanese are much more technically oriented, though. They look at the specs more. Uh, Americans look at the specs left, uh, less. Americans are value conscious, but they're also very, very brand conscious. And that changes. You know, we have the Vizios and the Gateways and the, even the Dells where they'll offer a product more on price than on the, brand, the strength of their brand. So we're always changing who the brand leaders are and some company strategies to be on price, some company strategies to go on brand. But Americans still are the ones that are defining the market for the future in terms of where products are introduced, whether they take off. Number one, the size and wealth of the market. Number two, historically, we're, we're getting a coast because of that. Certainly, Europe had us beat for a while in wireless technology. That has dramatically changed in part because of Verizon and AT&T and others have made huge investments here. We've kind of leapfrogged them into 4G and uh, broadband services, Wi-Fi. So in terms of the American psych, I think they're willing to experiment. I think mm -hmm. we have a love affair with our gadgets. Yeah. The average American home has about 25 of them, and they like the new thing. Where do you think Silicon Valley fits in the whole panorama of the future? Silicon Valley is definitely the center of the world in terms of innovation. It's undisputed. There's no question about that. Um, you can measure it by patents, VC money, companies, job growth. Whatever measure you want to use, I think Silicon Valley will come out on top. But having traveled the world, talking about innovation and writing about it, there are pockets of innovation almost everywhere I've been, whether it's been in Warsaw or Seattle, um, Boston or Maryland, or Northern Virginia, where I sit on the Northern Virginia Tech Council board. There's over 1,000 companies there. Uh, and what I think areas have in common, and even Paris now is France is doing very well in innovation. Every air, geographic area has strengths and weaknesses. Silicon Valley is great, phenomenal university, a culture of innovation, phenomenal financing, it's here. Willingness to take risks. On the other hand, negatives, you know, it's pretty expensive here. And that's a barrier for a lot of startups. Um, and Silicon Valley is not the home to most people in the world. And people like to start things and they like their families and like to stay near their homes. So uh, there are other areas, for example, the biomedical, uh, really good in, in San Diego, really good in Maryland. Um, there's clusters, either because of government investment, for example, take the defense industry. In the Washington area, tremendous benefits because of that. In other areas on the West Coast, great benefits. Take Israel. <coughs> 
I think Israel is actually more innovative in terms of if you define it by patents per person than anywhere in the world. Why? Multifactorial. You know, they're risk takers. When you're facing death every day by people surrounding you, taking a business risk is not a big deal. Yeah. They're question askers. They're naturally curious. They're serious. They have a mandatory draft for everyone. So you've had that shared common experience. You have a mission. You believe in the defense industry. Oh, and the defense industry investment, of course, is huge there and with spillover effects. So every area has strengths and weaknesses. And you know, my advice to those that are, have any specific geographic areas, figure out what they are and play off your strengths. And of course, you could try to build off your weaknesses, but you, you know, it's tough to strengthen a weakness. Same thing with people. Uh, you're going to be successful as an individual if you know yourself, if you have the emotional intelligence so you know what you're good at and know what you're bad at. You know, doing anyone who does employee reviews know that the way that they usually work is you tell them how good they are in a few sentences and you spend the rest of you talking about what they need improvement on. Well, the truth is what they need improvement on, especially at the senior levels, is not something they're going to be able to change. Yeah. yeah. So what you have to talk about is how you can complement them with people that are, uh, will match their weaknesses. And that's, that's, that's the, what, if you look at some of the great Silicon Valley success stories, uh, like even a Steve Jobs, it wasn't just Steve, Steve Jobs and, you know, Wozniak was the technical guy. He complimented Steve. You know, uh, anyone, even uh, Thomas Edison, he wasn't, although he had a lot of patents, he wasn't going it alone. He had a lot of partners there and, you know, hundreds of engineers in, in creating things. Um, where do you think uh, the, is there is there one part of the world where you think the next big opportunities are going to come from? Is it Israel? Is it somewhere else that you've seen that you're intrigued with now? Well, for example, let's take France. France is a great country with a great history, and it's it's focused on the senses. You know, the food tastes and smells good. The wine is just great. The perfumes you can smell, the, the materials for the styles, visually, how the French dress in, in, in Paris, is, it's just a beautiful, romantic, enchanting experience. And it's something which, that's their strength. How do they play off that? How do they shift to the next level of technology? And, and they're working on it and they're doing a good job on it. Um, Israel certainly, as we discussed, has, has so many things going for it, but with their, their weaknesses, they have no market, a domestic market to sell. I mean, it's tiny. And they're surrounded by hostility, so they have, to, they have to work on relationships and somehow solving the quagmire that, that you know, we've all lived through all our lives. Uh, so what area of the world that I'm excited about? I think Europe generally has been not met its potential. And if you think about what we have in America, we have the world's best movie industry, music industry, biotech. Obviously, every internet name is an American company in one way or the other, you know, whether you, it's Google or Yahoo or eBay or Amazon or Twitter or Wikipedia, they're, they're American companies. Why have we dominated the internet? Or, or chips, you know, Qualcomm, Intel, others. So we have it here. And that builds on itself after a while because you have critical masses in an area with education. And, and we also had the people that were wanting to come here from around the world, the best and the brightest. We've switched around on that. It's one of the issues we're working on. How do we make sure we can keep those PhDs that we're training in STEM? You know, 70% of them are, 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 are foreign and then we send them back home. You know, it's starting to hurt our defense industry. We got to change that. Uh, but in terms of area of the world, I, Israel, the US, uh, Pakistan, France, Eastern Europe has a lot of promise because they're scrappy, they're hungry, they're smart. India clearly in some ways, but they have challenges in infrastructure and poverty. Uh, Russia has potential if it can get over its um, corrupt system. And it's obviously its uh, present leadership is, is pretty anti-human rights. Um, and then of course there's China and you know, I have strong feelings about China. My five-year-old is fluent in Mandarin because my wife believes China is the future and we have uh, Chinese nannies that live with us and schooling and that's, they're not allowed to speak English to him. Um, but China is, is a country where, with different values than the US. We value private property and exploiting it and intellectual property. China has a different attitude and um, there's a culture clash there and there's a political leadership which is protecting itself it's, uh, there's a huge problem of corruption in China, and they have as a national policy that they want to 
follow us, be like this. They, they, they've proven they're the world's manufacturer, but they don't want to be that. They want to be the world's innovator, as does every country I go to. But they have a 10-year plan. That 10-year plan is based on a number of patents per 10,000 people. They have specific goals. They try to recruit and repatriate Chinese who have come here. They have a system of, they have 200, at this time we're speaking, there's 200,000 students in the US today from China, increasingly at younger ages, because they figured out that they're copiers. They're not innovators, so they realize they gotta get that culturally. They gotta get the kids US trained while they're young, and then have them come back to China. And you know, sadly, the US is standing by and letting all this happen. We're so free market oriented in a way, we don't care if people steal the people that we educate, we push them out. Right. What do you think about China's strategy? I think that uh, the concern that I have is the Chinese leadership's primary concern is the Chinese leadership. So they'll do anything to keep their power, which means obviously they restrict access to the internet, they restrict free discussion, which restricts creativity. I think the most creative people in the world don't want to be restricted. They want to know they could talk to anyone without the fear that the government's going to come down if they say something they disagree with. Uh, China has weaknesses, and in, in until recently they've had a pretty strict one-child policy. So every child has six people that are doting on them, the parents and the grandparents. So those six people focus on one kid. You know, some people in China say it's a spoiled child world generation. And I think there's some truth to that. Mm. Um, and so the hours of work, the work ethic, the ability to, to create and innovate when everything's been handed to you, it's, it's a fear a lot of us that are successful in the U.S. have fear with our own children. If you're successful, how can they be hungry enough to try to succeed on their own? Mm -hmm. Uh, I heard the, the woman who heads, uh, until recently, British Aerospace, uh, she gave a speech recently, and she said in the question and answer period something which struck me and got audience applause. She said she had given advice to her child which was mistaken. He said, go to any school you want, major in anything you want. And that's still the attitude of parents here in the U.S. She said, I should have said, major in something that will get you a job, mm -hmm. and then if you want to pursue your, your life dreams, go ahead. And, and we've done that now as a generation. So for example, our strategy today is non-existent in, in, in innovation. Our strategy is you throw government money, you give it the R&D tax credit, and we're gonna be an innovative country. At the same time, we're restricting immigration. We're not getting the best and the brightest anymore. We, when we do get the, the best smart people to come to our universities and we spend $6 billion a year on them with National Science Foundation money, we kick them out. And as parents, we encourage our kids to study things like art history, which can't get them jobs. It doesn't make sense. And our government is giving away pushing money on kids so they get out in such debt. They won't have jobs and they can't afford to pay it. And they promiscuously give away money so that an art history major and a mathematics major get the same loan at the same interest rate. So we have a shortage of three main jobs. And we, we culturally have a lack of respect for those that, that um, are in skilled labor. So if they're electricians, or they're computer programmers or something like that, and they can get a two-year degree from a, computer, from a community college, we look down at them. So every parent's dream is to have a four-year college. It's insanity. Mm. So we're on a path which I think is very dangerous because we're not addressing our big problems financially. We're not addressing our human capital problems. We have a shortage of workers, and we're relying, increasingly relying on the rest of the world to do our stuff. So all we'll have left is our ability to innovate. And that's why we have to focus on innovation. But we also have to address these other areas. You know, whether it's through creating apprenticeship programs or changing our educational structure or allowing more free market education to occur or just leadership at the top. Whoever is president of the United States has an obligation to number one, unite us and not divide us, not create enemies from within, and also to talk about the biggest problems and how we address them. The, the reality that parents have a job, communities have a job, Americans have a job, and our job is to raise the next generation and give them a life better than our own. And I don't think there's even a discussion or awareness of them now at our top leadership level, whether it be Democrat or Republican. That's really a great lead into my final question, which I ask everybody, and that's uh, if you were giving someone who's young, older than your children, but, uh, but still looking to plan their career or their future, and if they were thinking about technology in particular, what advice would you give them? Well. I actually have two books out, and the first book gives some significant advice, and I was thrilled by the fact that when my second book came out, a lot of people who bought the first book had given it to their children, and I got a lot of stories coming about, you influenced my kid to go get their PhD in math, or, you, or so, a lot of uh, advanced education in hard science, and also start a business. A lot of people said, I started a business because of what I read that you wrote. So my advice is very transparent. It's, 
it is true that when you're younger, you can take risks. You could start something. You know, my advice is don't be afraid to fail. Failure is an opportunity to learn. You don't learn when you succeed. You just think you're brilliant and you think you're doing things right. In, in truth, you're very lucky and you might have randomly made a good decision and you might be in some ways smart, but you have to fail to succeed. And that's the lesson of America that we, I think we, we share as a country compared to others where if you fail, you're out of it in most cultures. Um, the second thing is, is yes, be passionate about what you're doing and studying, but be realistic as well. You need to get a job, whether you create a job for yourself or you go into something where there's demand, but you have to be realistic. I hate to use art history as an example again, but studying history, and, and is, it's not that there's not a great art opportunity in a computer history museum, and history is incredibly important, but it's difficult to get a job if you're a history major. And I, having said that, my youngest son has a degree, a master's degree, no less, in the history of science and technology, and he's having a tough time. And, and so I'm seeing it firsthand. Um, but the, the, as parents, you have an obligation to your kids. The number one obligation is to instill confidence in them. If you've done that, you've, you're 90% there as parents. Obviously, the other 10% is pretty big. I mean, ethics is probably more than 50%. You have to instill that. But you have to instill enough confidence so they can take failure and move on. And that's one thing I think culture we're pretty good at. But it's this thing of, you know, study whatever you want and don't worry what will happen is not realistic anymore. We need people who could fix cars. We need people who could do different things. So get a marketable skill and then pursue your passion. Mm. And also, you know, consider other areas outside of where you live. Consider Washington, for example, is a great area because there's a lot of smart people there trying to solve big problems. So there's a lot of different areas you should go to, and, and usually advice is more customized. And it's, uh, I have found one of the things I've learned is the best way you sell something is by asking questions and figuring out what the person's challenges, desires, goals are, and then you can answer the question of what advice you'd give them. You just can't start selling them the way you'd sell a car. You know, this car is great. You want to know how they what they're going to drive for, what they use it for, do they want to envision kids in it or, or not. I mean, that's how you sell a car mm -hmm. if you're good at it. If you're not, you just start selling the car. You and the president are pretty hard on art historians. I, uh, or art history majors. No, I'm, I, I think, I'm sorry, I, I realized midway that I'm sitting here in a, this wonderful tribute <laughs> to the history of technology. Um, and it's incredibly important, but it is the reality also, of course we must study history. But we could only have so many people who study, uh, you know, you could, I don't want to be politically incorrect and talk about the history of any particular race or religion or sex, because sure. there's a lot of people major in that. And then they're befuddled why they can't get a job. On the other hand, if you studied, for example, English or another foreign language and you became a great writer, there's a tremendous demand for writers. Um, not as much as some journalists would like, but people who could put a sentence together, people who could work on a team, people who are empathetic, people who have skills in diverse areas who see the picture. I tell my own employees, you want to, here's how you succeed. You don't just think about your job, you think about the organization. You do a lot of things. One of the things you do is get outside your job, go to other industries, other groups, volunteer, and creativity is the ability to put different thoughts together in a novel way that will have some value. And that is, make something happen essentially mm -hmm. is what it's saying. Do something and shows that you're seeing the forest. And that, that's something Americans are pretty good at. So I have no problems with people in art history. I think it's great. I know art history majors. Um, and I'm sorry, I could come up with others, but it, there's a lot of majors out there. And of course, there's a lobby of people that teach this stuff, which gets very upset any time someone says that. And the challenge we face in our country is we do not have the political will or leadership to say, look, this is what's important, and this is what's not important. Whereas before, when we had a shortage of nurses and things like that, we could say, here are some special scholarships. Now, our strategy is we just throw money at kids, force them to take full scholarships, and they owe, you know, at this point, a trillion dollars in debt. And you know, the next big battle may be forgive the debt, mm. which is absurd, but that's where we're heading. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're at a critical point. You always think you're at a critical point in history when you're talking at that moment in time mm -hmm. that you're sharing with everyone else because this is the most important game of the season, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're, you know, we're clearly on a precipice as a nation, financially, morally, ethically. You know, as we talk, there's huge issues of privacy, um, government monitoring, what government can do. Our worldwide reputation is suffering. We've hurt our allies by monitoring their conversations. We're viewed as, as not caring about people's privacy. There's a lack of moral leadership. There's a tremendous number of wars in, in the world and revolutions which we have no say over. We're making some bad decisions. We have a 
Congress and a president which can't work together, and even a Congress which can't work together, and we're at, we hate each other. And it's, it's a bad moment. Despite that, our stock market's doing good. Maybe we're the prettiest of seven ugly sisters. We're doing okay as a country. But thinking 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50, 100 years out, what are we doing? Well, we are heading towards certain things that are certain. We're heading towards driverless cars, which will solve a lot of our health problems and, and also in terms of uh, fatal accidents. We're headed, but it will cause a lot of other problems. You know, what happens to the insurance companies? What happens to the doctors? What happens to the, the towing specialists and the fender bender fixers and, the, and yeah. everyone else who lives off the fact that people have car accidents? Yeah. Uh, what happens to all those drivers who drive all those taxis and trucks and cars? On the other hand, that'll free up productive time in cars in a very safe way. We're heading towards uh, situations where we have technology coming which will change us. We have technology change occurring, which is huge today. It's not only driverless cars which we're heading towards. 3D printing is a wonderful thing. New ways of delivering things to the home or transporting or testing or experimenting or checking your fields through drones is huge. You know, in the future, maybe you'll have three ways of getting something that you want. You create it yourself in your home with a 3D printer that you could use various componentry or molecular level inputs. You could have it delivered by a drone to your house, or you could have a driverless car that will drop it off. I mean, there's so many choices of doing things. And, and there'll be other ways, or you know, maybe it'll be the, the Star Trek teleporter thing, which was everyone's fantasy who right. flies in these slow planes today. Um, There'll be different ways of doing things. And we're also at a time in history where you know, we are on the brink of great discoveries with genetics and healthcare and telemedicine and the ability to diagnose and the ability to treat and the ability to, to figure out what works and what doesn't, which is really very hit or miss even today. Uh, and it's more based on what doctor you go to than really on established medical principles. And it's based on a system which encourages doctors to do a lot of testing and raise healthcare bills. So we're, we're, we have the tools. We have some technology trends which are pretty clear. We're running up against Moore's Law in a few years, I guess. Uh, but still, there's so many things which are changing the world, including you know, MEMS, you know, mic microelectronic mechanical sensors, which are transformative in their ability to sense different things and their ability to um, give you information which is important to you or, or, or provide information from things that are connected to things yeah. which can act on their own. So, you know, your shades can go up when the, it's right for the energy usage in your home uh, automatically. Or I'm looking forward to the, you know, just uh, as, you know, turning, not only getting something from the refrigerator to the oven in the process and doing that remotely or getting the heat on remote. I mean, these things are starting to happen. Collision yeah. avoidance is starting to occur. So we have a lot of great things that are coming which will transform lives, transform society, and transform jobs. And we have issues. We have issues over privacy that we have to confront as a society over what information you're entitled to, to keep private. We have issues over the ethical uses of technology, what is ethically good or bad. You know, uh, can you have glass in your eyes which identifies people mm -hmm. and tells you their social history? Mm -hmm. Well, here we are, first generation. Google is saying we will, will not provide that as part of Google Glass. Well, people like me are forgetful with names, feel that's a real loss. Yeah. So there's issues we're confronting in society now which will determine innovation in the future. And my challenge and the challenge of our industry is to make sure that nothing is cut off that has promising potential. Mm -hmm. And that consumers be allowed to decide these things. Consumers be allowed to figure out what information they give up the way we give information to a tailor now if we want a better fit for our clothing. We have to give up private information. And we have to get over it the way we got over it when we introduced credit cards. And you know, government had a good response there. Government said, you know what, $50 maximum liability for credit card usage. And consumers feel very comfortable using it, most consumers, even though they know that they, their credit card can be stolen, yeah, as hacked. it is. The yeah. problem is now private information is associated with that credit card. So you have all sorts of issues. New issues will come up. Uh, issues in, you know, we have opportunities in education, which are absolutely huge now to figure out that people learn differently. Individuals learn differently. And, we can get the best teachers, we can get the best education, it can be customized, we can do it. Well, how does that affect teachers and their jobs? How does the, car, the, the driverless car affect all these jobs? Mm -hmm. Our mm -hmm. challenge with technology in the future is going to be, are we creating jobs or are we not creating jobs? And if you think of the history of technology, which I know you do every day, uh, you know, Americans have been pretty good about using technology to, to provide benefits. Americans certainly hate waiting in lines. Mm. So a lot of the technologies, we've solved the waiting in line problem. We don't wait in line for a bank teller anymore. We have ATMs. 
We don't wait online for a lot of things anymore. We use uh, devices and applications like Uber and other things to get what we want when we want it. So our, wine, our line waiting time has gone down dramatically through technology. The question is, can our health improve? Can everything else improve? And how does that affect jobs? And we're going to be struggling with that issue, I think, for years. Because we create a phenomenal number of jobs and opportunities, and there's spillover effect for other service jobs. But the fact is, on a net net basis, my fear is, as technology continues to improve, it's going to impact jobs. And I think jobs is not only necessary for a healthy economy, I think jobs are necessary for self-worth and a form of, of, of life where, where you, you are giving something to society and what you're getting back is some satisfaction that you're making a difference. And we have to start addressing that. And it may be that the people who are freed up from jobs are volunteering and helping be companions with older people or something like that. That may be an answer. But I don't know how that would work economically. We have to have that type of discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was a totally different answer to your question. But you said it was my last question, so I wanted to get into. I wanted to get into. Good. And I want to close by thanking you for the opportunity. I think this, what you're doing here is amazing, because although it's history, it's recent history. It's phenomenally recent history. And I know it goes back over 100 years in different ways, but we're still at the beginning of this thing. Yeah. We're still barely crawling as infants, and we have a ways to go. And I, I am just so honored and privileged to be a little part of it by coming here today and sharing my thoughts with you. And. Uh, if my grandchildren are ever watching this, I'm doing it for you guys, or girls, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> That's great, Gary, and I hope they will. I hope they are watching it many generations from now. Thanks for doing this today. Thank we're, you. We're really glad you're here. Thanks.